So now that we've established what some of the teachings of Arius were, let's talk about their reactions to his assertions. First, we can focus on Alexander of Alexandria. Uh, you have a letter that he has composed that you read for this week. Here he lays out his theology, his Christology. He wants to assert that Jesus Christ is equal to God the Father in terms of divinity. So he wants to say the Logos is divine, but is eternally generated from the Father. So it is constantly a reality emerging from God. But there is a distinction in the hypostasis of the Logos and the Father. So here's how he's trying to avoid modalism. He's saying there is a being, an individual reality we'll call Logos. There is an individual reality we'll call Father. And they're both constantly, eternally in relationship to each other. So he'll say something like, the Father is without origin. Nothing creates the Father. The Father always precedes all things. And the Son is always there with the Father. And so he wants to talk about this in some detail. And so if you have Cochlean Sterk, turn page 100. We're going to look at uh, section 15 on page 100. That's right in the middle of the page. He says this, Therefore, concerning the fact that the Son of God came into existence from nothing, and that there, and that not was there once when he is not, John the Evangelist instructed sufficiently, writing about him being, quote, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. So here, Alexander is using a scriptural passage to establish his Christology from John 1 18. For the divine teacher and foresight shows that the two things, the Father and the Son, are inseparable from one another. There he specified that he is in the bosom of the Father. And in regards to the fact that the word of God is not numbered with those who came into existence from nothing, the same John declares that all things came into existence through him. For John makes clear the word's distinctive hypostasis, saying, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And all things came to existence through him, and without him, nothing came into existence. Okay, so there is this eternal presence of word and father. And they are distinct in how they behave, but they are eternally together in some fundamental way. And all things come into existence through the word by the will of the Father. So this is how Alexander is trying to show he's not endorsing a modalist position. But we can also observe he appears to be moving away from a subordinationist view, where he's beginning to articulate some kind of equality between son and father. This leads to the Council of Nicaea. The controversy generated between Arius and Alexander spreads throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. Constantine has come to be emperor. Now, next week, we're going to spend a lot more time on Constantine and his Christian identity. One of the things that's clear is that theological unrest or religious discord among Christians interferes with Constantine's vision as Christianity as a means to help unify his empire. Because Constantine has favored Christianity legally, he also holds that the emperor in some ways has the right to convene councils of the church. And so he gathers together bishops from throughout the church to discuss this issue. What comes out of the Council of Nicaea is what we call the Nicene Creed, a creed that for Episcopalians, Roman Catholics, is recited every Sunday at the Eucharist. So let's read from that again in Cochlean Sterk. This is on page 101. It says this, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God the only begotten of his Father, of the substance of the Father, 
God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father. That sentence I just read really articulates what is distinctive in the Council of Nicaea. What follows the rest of the creed actually looks very similar to other early baptismal creeds. So let's stop there and think about some of the phrases that we've just heard. So the Nicene Creed says Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. That's a very typical uh, title. We saw that in uh, Just a Martyr. What does that mean? It means the only begotten one, the Son, is from the substance of the Father. Now, there's a word being used here that I have in the lecture notes. Substance is coming from the Greek word oisia, which could also mean something like being. So he's from the being of the Father. And then goes on to say, in a few, uh, after a few phrases, he is consubstantial or homoousius with the Father. He is of the same being of the Father. So there's his phrases, true God of true God, a light from light. Those are all kind of figures of speech trying to express this concept of being consubstantial or of the same being with the Father. And so we could say the Son has this particular title of only begotten because his oisia or his being or his substance is the same as that of the fathers. Okay, so again, let's practice rehearsing what this means. I'm gonna state it again. Jesus Christ, as the only begotten Son of God, is generated out of the Father's essence or being, his oisia. The Son is not created, isn't a thing God makes but is always co-eternal with the Father. And this relationship between Son and Father is the means by which all else comes into being through the Son. The Son is the conduit point for all the rest of existence. It's worth thinking about this word homoousius a little bit more, consubstantial, being of the same substance. This is not a phrase you would find in the New Testament. It's generally not a common theological term among Greek-speaking Christians. So it's a neologism. It's a word that's sort of been coined to try to express in words this transcendent spiritual reality. It is a sharing of an equal essence of two things. It is the full equality of Son with Father and how we get to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. In the next lecture, we're going to see more about how the Spirit fits into this as well. Let's just think about the impact of the Council of Nicaea in resolving this debate with Arius or not. At the Council of Nicaea, the council anathematizes or uh, condemns and essentially excommunicates anyone who holds the father pre-exists the son. That is, it all of a sudden makes subordinationism, which had been a perfectly legitimate Christological position, now a heresy. And so Constantine implements after that a policy of trying to reconcile the uh, warring factions here, so to speak, and to unify them together. This does not work well. And the Aryan wing organizes itself into um, a form of their own orthodoxy. They reject the Nicene Creed as innovative. They are theological conservatives, and they reject it. And they create confessions that omit homoousius in its Trinitarian and Christological formulations. The bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia leads this party, and he um, dominates the Eastern Church, really, for 30 years. And Arius, ironically, sort of fades from the scene. Uh, he goes off to the east, and we really don't know much about what happens to him, but Eusebius takes over his role of advancing the subordinationist view. In 328, um, 
Alexander and then his uh, Archdeacon Athanasius, who will become bishop after him, both refused to accept Arius back in Alexandria as a presbyter, even though Constantine and the Council of Nicaea had required it. Uh, Athanasius becomes bishop in 328, and he is exiled multiple times by a variety of emperors over several decades um, who uh, are unhappy with his refusal to compromise with the Arian party. This creates an ongoing conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean. The Arian position was actually pretty politically powerful, but because of Athanasius' uh, tenaciousness, he ends up allowing the Nicene position to carry the day uh, by the middle of the 4th century, sometime in the 360s. That's a lot. Again, a lot to process here. Try to sit down and maybe write up a few questions you have now about Christology, Trinitarian theology, based on how we've discussed it in this video. And in our last video, we'll talk about uh, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit.